bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Today's webinar is titled, What Role Can Schools Play in the Pathway to Youth Mental Health Care? I'd also like to mention the 2015 CAFC Annual Conference, which is coming up on October 18th to the 20th in Quebec City. Everyone is in invited to join us uh, in Quebec City, where we'll be learning and sharing uh, expertise from across the country and finding solutions in children's health care. So if you do need in more information on the CAFC Conference, including registration information, uh, you can go to conference.cafc.org, and you can find all the information, including the program and everything else. Uh, the early bird let deadline is approaching next week, uh, so please, if you do want to take advantage of the early bird discounts on registration, please uh, be sure to register uh, in the next few days. All right, so on with uh, today's presentation. We've had huge interest in, in today's topic, uh, you know, not just today for this webinar, but even over the last few years. Uh, all of our members at CAFC have struggled with a number of different issues related to providing services to children and youth with mental illness, and that includes our acute care centers, emergency departments. It's really an issue that cuts across the, the continuum of care that CAFC represents. Uh, we've had a number of presentations at CAFC conference over the last few years, and this specific approach of working with the education sector to provide services to children within the school setting has come up over and over again. So today's topic is really timely. It's, re it's really uh, certainly uh, is the reason why we have we have so many people registered for today's webinar. So I think it's going to be a really important presentation today that's going to touch on a topic of great interest uh, to everyone across the CAFC community. So uh, I know we're all interested in getting into it. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's panel. Uh, with us, uh, first off, we have Dr. Stan Kucher, who is uh, certainly needs no uh, introduction to anyone who's followed children and youth mental health uh, research in Canada. He's an internationally renowned expert in mental and adolescent mental health and an international leader in mental health research, advocacy, training, policy, and services innova innovation, working at the IWK Health Center and Dalhousie University. Dr. Kucher also holds the position of Sun Life Financial Chair in Adolescent Mental Health and is the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center in Mental Health Policy and Training. And joining uh, Dr. Kucher is Ms. Yifeng Wei, uh, who's a PhD candidate uh, and a researcher and at, and at the school and school mental health lead uh, with the Sun Life Financial Chair in Adolescent Mental Health. Ms. Wei has played a key role in national and international school mental health re research and program development activities, and her research interest has focused on promoting mental health literacy in schools to help achieve better understanding about mental health and mental disorders, reducing stigma against mental il illness, obtaining and maintaining good mental health, and enhancing uh, help-seeking behaviors. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, hand the virtual podium out to, to the East Coast to uh, in Halifax to Dr. Stan Kucher and Ms. Yi Feng Wei. Over to you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, very appreciated, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, CAPC for their support of this webinar, and in specific, but also to recognize the tremendous work that CAPC does across the country in improving uh, health outcomes for children and young people. And uh, also before we start, I would uh, like to recognize uh, a number of people across Canada who have contributed in large part to the research uh, on what we will be discussing, uh, without whose uh, incredibly hard work uh, this information just would not be available. That includes Rob Millen and Cynthia Weaver in Ontario, Leanne Boyd and Paul MacArthur in Manitoba, Andrew Baxter and Laurie Watson Rowe in Alberta and Wendy Carr in British Columbia. So <clears throat> I want to focus our discussion on the orphan of the orphan. And people remember that from the Senate report 
on uh, mental health in Canada, which read, led to the successful creation of the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And I think it's useful for us to think critically and advance our understanding of the construct of mental health, and that is to realize that mental health is really the successful adaptation to life circumstances appropriate to age and development and capabilities. And very specifically now, we're coming to realize that it's important to stress that mental health does not mean the antithesis of a mental disorder, and it does not mean the uh, absence of negative emotional states. In fact, negative emotional states can be a necessary part of achieving good mental health. And we have a fair bit of semantic confusion across this country and in many places around the globe around what these words actually mean. And it is really important that when we start to discuss these issues in the school setting and in the healthcare setting and in the public context, that we are very clear. These are just a number of terms that I've taken from various government documents pertaining to mental health and mental illness. And you can see that there is some confusion about what one would mean with, a, for example, a mental wellness illness. And if you're very interested in this, you can just Google the mental uh, happiness test and you can find out a wonderful test about mental happiness, which was not what uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, considered when he penned the, uh, the American Declaration. Uh, there he built on John Locke's construct of happiness being part of what a human being is as opposed to a, a specific kind of, of emotional state. Nonetheless, it's quite useful for us to consider this triangle. We notice that mental health and mental illness are not on a continuum, that an individual can have a mental illness, a mental health problem such as grief or demoralization or a major challenge in the school setting, loss of a job, for example, and mental distress, which is the dealing with the slings and arrows of outrageous daily fortune all at the same time, and that our challenge is to ensure that as we think critically about understanding mental health and mental disorders and their interrelationships, that we really use the words that we have very clearly. One of the things that we find working with schools and actually also with health providers is, for example, here I've put up the word depression. Often people mean I'm unhappy or I'm disappointed and they use the word depression for that. They can discuss the difficulty in a mental health problem and they use the word depression when demoralized would be more appropriate. And of course, depression is also used to describe the clinical syndrome of depression. And when people are using a word such as depression colloquially or using it to describe normal emotional distress states, that tends to obfuscate what we're actually doing. And it's really clear to us that we have to really focus on part of this understanding, which in itself actually is part of mental health literacy, which we will be discussing a little bit later on in terms of the school setting. Some of these things are very important because the words that we use and the way that we approach these different components in the triangle actually are linked to various specific things that we can do in the school setting. So for example, if we want to enhance mental well-being, health promotion is really the key driving pattern there addressing distress in the school situation really focuses on helping build resilience and, um, sorry, I hit the wrong button here, uh, helping, uh, helping build resilience and this does not mean avoiding uh, various and forwards. <clears throat> what I wanted to point out here is building resilience and uh, focusing on uh, dealing, oh, here we are, helping kids actually deal with the normal stresses of life in a positive way, uh, addresses the distress issue, enhancing usual supports in schools like counseling services for problems, but also for addressing mental disorders, putting in best-in-class care. Now, what we have actually discovered is that if we look overall at young people in Canada and look at the Stats Canada data, 
by and large, most Canadians are flourishing when it comes to mental health. The big issues that we are still trying to address properly is access to evidence-based mental health care. If we actually look at youth access to mental health care, for example, when I was in medical school in 1975, about one in four young people were able to easily access mental health care. It's improved somewhat, as the latest stats can data shows us, but it's still nowhere near where it needs to be. We're, f we're seeing also the increasing use of emergency rooms as an entry point for common disorders, for example, anxiety and depression, disorders which can easily be treated in primary care, and many of you will have seen the CHI-HI data of this year pointing that out. The other concern that many of us who are working in healthcare centers have is that the quality and reproducibility of mental health care that young people get, either across different institutions or within the same institution, is not necessarily the same. And frankly, in this country, we have shameful pockets of despair. We are really not very good at all of addressing the mental health care needs of homeless youth, First Nations youth, youth living in poverty, youth in the justice system, and youth who are refugees. So those are all major challenges that we face. A very interesting paper recently published in Pediatrics uh, in British Columbia pointed out that in the last few years, the number of mental health visits, the percent of mental health visits to uh, emergency room increased dramatically, as you can see in the bar on your left-hand side, although the percentage of young people who were actually hospitalized as a result of the emergency room visit actually went down. Now, the authors, uh, interestingly enough, pointed out that the proportion of high acuity cases went down. They felt that this uh, use of the emergency room for low acuity suggests decreased resilience. Uh, one would wonder whether that is necessarily the case, and I think that maybe a different perspective on this would be that young people who now realize, because of much of the discussion about the importance of mental health and, and better education information in the media and in the public about mental illness, are now accessing care, but there is no place to access that care very well, and so they, by default, end up going to the emergency room for types of care that might be better addressed in primary health care. This is uh, Kessler's work from the large uh, multinational study of uh, the diagnostic point of mental disorders. I just uh, put this up to show the, uh, the oft understood uh, information that about 70 to 75 percent of all mental disorders can be diagnosed before age 25. Knowing this and knowing that many of these disorders when the onset are mild to moderate in intensity really is a challenge to us. We really have to look at addressing the mental health needs of young people at the time of the onset of these disorders. In mental health, we are one of the few areas that waits until people get very, very ill before we start to take their illness seriously. So we have to start to move into that part of the lifespan in a major, major way. So some of the biggest barriers to actually accessing mental health care in young people is the lack of mental health literacy of young people and their families. And by the mental health literacy, what we mean is four different things. The ability to obtain and maintain good mental health, the knowledge of mental disorders and their treatments, addressing stigma against mental illness or stigma against its treatment, which is, which is also a major problem, and lack of health-seeking efficacy, knowing when and where to get help, and very importantly, having the tools, the self-help and self-care tools to help enhance the quality of care uh, for better outcomes. The other huge challenge for us across this country is the lack of availability of mental health care and primary health care, and I do want to identify the PSP program of the British Columbia the Medical Association as a national leader in addressing this particular need in the primary care area. Uh, Primary care settings and primary care structures may need to be modified to enhance the capacity of primary care providers to deliver high quality mental health care for young people. But many young people with mild to moderate mental disorders 
can be well treated in primary care, and we'll discuss that very briefly at the very end of the population. And the third big issue that we have is the lack of unique community care portals for special populations. For example, the great work that Steve Mathias is doing in British Columbia, looking at alternative portals of care for young people who are having uh, difficulties fitting into usual social and primary care situations. So what I'd like to just uh, put here on this diagram is the actual horizontally integrated pathway to mental health care for young people. You will notice that on the side of the family, the combination of environmental factors, particularly the early adversity and heritability, uh, really combine to increase the probability or decrease the probability that any one young person will actually be developing a mental disorder. In an ideal situation, the families would be linked to a primary health care provider, and that person is well placed to educate, advise, monitor, identify, diagnose, treat, refer, and support young people at any point in the lifespan uh, who should be at high risk for or who are developing a mental disorder. Unfortunately, that's not often the case, and so the next place that we have as an institutional response to young people's needs is the school setting. And here, although I will be focusing on junior high and secondary schools, similar things can be identified for primary schools, albeit in a slightly different type of population. Schools are ideally placed to educate, to identify, triage, and even to treat, to refer, and to support young people who have a mental disorder. CAP means Community Access Point, and what I will be showing later on is the application of a community access point actually within a school setting and some of the data showing how effective that kind of model and that kind of approach could be. And of course, mental health specialty services being exactly what they should be, which is specialty services dealing with low volume, uh, high acuity cases and providing support to all the other aspects and all the other components of this in horizontally integrated pathway to care. So what we are needing to do is actually not build new systems of care. So this is not about tearing down what we have. This is actually building on strengthening existing systems. One of the really important lessons that I have learned from a decade or more of work in Sub-Saharan Africa is that if you don't strengthen existing systems, things tend to fall apart. So this is not about creating programs and parachuting programs into locations. This is building the strength and capacity within the location itself. This has to be done in a manner which is horizontally integrated. So as in the previous diagram, you could see that there is a unidirectional, no, a bidirectional movement, a horizontal integrated movement between the school setting, primary care, and specialty mental health services. This approach has to be sustainable. It can't be just put into place within a budget line for a program this year and having the budget line disappear next year, which is an all too common problem. It has to be cost effective with a good return on investment and the interventions have to be reproducible. And here I'm going to argue that good reproduction at the systems level does not require fidelity of application to achieve similar results. What it requires actually, interestingly, as I think we will be able to show you, is fidelity of competency. So if you enhance the competency of the human services providers within systems of care, you actually will get really good outcomes without having to have fidelity of the application of care. This is a huge difference between this model and a program uh, model which demands fidelity of application of a particular program in order to get a particular outcome. This next slide, the population health status times investment, is just for us to soberly reflect on the issue of cost and the improvement in health status. If you look at the left-hand corner of your slide, you'll see a particular investment in the health uh, system cost increasing the health status quite significantly if the investment is done when the health status of a population is relatively low. When you look at a health status of a population, such as Canada now, where the health status is actually relatively good over 
for all, you can invest the same amount of money and see very, very little in what you're actually going to get at the population level. So what this tells us is that focused and not universal interventions actually might be really important here. And the focus here is on mental health care, which as we know is an area that has not the same kind of status in terms of access to care and effective outcomes of care as other parts of healthcare do. So the next uh, slide shows a conceptual framework of how we link education and healthcare systems. And we will be talking today about what happens in the box on the left with mental health literacy, with the go-to educator model, and with youth healthcare centers. So the first question that we have for people to use is the question, which of the following do not contribute significantly to the pathway, so a horizontally integrated pathway to mental health care for young people? And you choose all that apply, junior high schools, secondary schools, school-based youth health centers, standalone stigma programs, or primary health care settings. All right, for those of you who haven't done a poll with us before, this is your chance to just go up and click right on the screen and, and make your selection. Uh, which of the following do not cont contribute significantly to the pathway to mental health care for young people? And this is a uh, uh, to choose one of the following. All that apply. Oh, no, yeah. Choose which of the following do not contribute. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I think we've uh, set this question up wrong uh, because it, it is a single, uh, we're only allowing a single answer here. That's our mistake when we created this question. No problem. So then now people know there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> Narrows it down a bit. Yeah. Uh, so we'll just close this one off and we'll, we'll see what people did say if they had to do. When, when forced to choose only one, the one they chose uh, was standalone anti-stigma programs. So. Right. Okay. That's the that's the right that's the right answer because they are not horizontally integrated. They are standalone, and, and they are subject to the vagarities of funding or whoever feels like supporting that kind of intervention. All right. Can we move on? Yeah. Yeah. Well, please do. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> now, do I have the control back, Paul? Yeah, you do have the control. I'm not getting any movement here. You may have to just click on the middle of the slide just to bring the slide as the forward application. Just click anywhere on your PowerPoint slide. and. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now what we're going to focus in on is the issue of mental health literacy in terms of addressing that first piece in the, in, in the uh, pathway to care. And I want to point out here uh, a recent quote from a uh, WHO publication on uh, health literacy. Uh, and mental health literacy is a significant component of health literacy. A stronger predictor of an individual's health status and income, employment status, education, and racial or ethnic group. Now that is quite an incredible comment. So what this tells us is that health literacy, mental health literacy, is a fundamental necessity for addressing health inequalities, for addressing all sorts of aspects related to a person's health, and Relate, related to their mental health. So mental health literacy, as we conceive it, is the foundation for health promotion, prevention, treatment, and care. Now in schools, mental health literacy approaches have had two different ways of being applied. The most common way that they're applied is a non-sustainable episodic model in which students obtain some information, teachers obtain some information, the programs come from outside the school and are not embedded nor sustained. The model and the approach that we use embed the mental health literacy competency into the school setting through the teachers, through curriculum, and the teachers apply that in their own lives. And you can see we're now getting data from research studies looking and showing that their own mental health uh, improves and the, the students they apply that mental health literacy to students so it becomes sustainable within the actual organization itself. So now we have question number two. School-based mental health literacy interventions that are embedded into school curriculum are preferred to programs put into schools because, and then you can choose those that apply. 
And we do have it correct. You can choose all that apply on this question. So school-based and NHL is mental health literacy. Uh, so school-based mental health literacy interventions that are embedded into school curriculum are preferred to programs put into schools because, and then choose all that you think apply. Uh, so I did not mention at the top, but there were a couple of requests for the slides, a, power, a PDF of the PowerPoint slides that uh, our presenters are using today. There is a handout section that will allow you to download the, uh, the slides in your uh, control panel. So if anyone wants to click on that net and download those, uh, it's the same that is being presented on the screen. You can go ahead and do that. And uh, I think we've got most of the responses into the poll, so we'll just close that off and see what people thought. And it looks like uh, they are preferred, uh, people felt that they were preferred, the, the, the number one uh, selection at 98% was that they enhance uh, mental health literacy for teachers and students concurrently, followed closely by that they may be more sustainable over time. Uh, at 88%, we had, they have demonstrated continued impact over time. And at 39%, they don't need uh, fidelity of application to show positive outcomes. The, the only 2% said they are more expensive. All right, they're very incredibly good. Um, the right answer for this one would be one, two, three, and five. All right. Okay, so uh, if though people are interested in actually the materials that we have created and have studied here, uh, this is all available for free online at teenmentalhealth.org, and that's the curriculum guide. Uh, teachers come on, everything is modular, everything is web-based, the lesson plans are there. They can download it, uh, and once they're trained, they can apply it in their classroom. So now I'm going to turn over to you, Fen Wei, who's going to give you some of the data on how uh, this uh, actually turns out in real life. Okay, I'm just introduced very quickly um, about how we're going, how we uh, <coughs> deliver the curriculum guide across Canada. Uh, we decided to apply this trained trainer model after. Uh, consulting with uh, educators across Canada. Uh, the way it works is that first we work with school boards to let school boards to decide who they wanted to choose as the trainers of uh, the curriculum guide. But we do suggest that uh, school boards should uh, choose classroom teachers and in school health uh, professionals and local mental health professionals to form a, a very strong team so they learn from each other and support each other. So this is how the school boards identify the trainers first. And then after they identify all the trainers, we go to schools and uh, we deliver the training of the curriculum guide um, within a day and a half. So what we did usually in schools is to um, build a foundation about understanding of mental health literacy, and then we go through the curriculum guide module by module, because um, this is a module approach to mental health literacy. There are six modules embedded in the curriculum guide. And then on the second half day, we it's a like, question and answer session. We delivered to the trainers, and then trainers can, answer, or can ask us questions or they can present, volunteer to present the materials they learned from the first day. Um, after the training, um, they deliver uh, the curriculum guide to the classroom teachers, usually grade nine um, classroom uh, teachers. And then they support the teaching of the curriculum guide in the school. So here's some data we have so far, for, starting from 2012 to uh, 2015, we have significant more data than we presented here. Uh, but I wanted to highlight a few things here. You will notice that from different provinces, we have different uh, study designs or program evaluations. And we have evaluated both educators and students. What I wanted to highlight here is that we measure three outcomes, including the knowledge, attitudes, and help seeking efficacy. And you will notice that um, on, under the increased knowledge column, you will, you will see that the knowledge of, about mental health literacy has improved significantly across different provinces and among teachers and students. And you will notice that the D value, D stands for Cohen's uh, effect size D, you will notice that the D value of knowledge um, has increased 
significantly, you will notice that more than like like usually the D value of 0.8 is the large effect size. You will notice that this all the effect sizes of the training program have have succeeded like 0.8. And you will notice that under the improved attitudes, the the attitudes towards mental health and mental illness have improved significantly as well, but not so much as knowledge because of the ceiling effect. And you will also notice that the effect size is a little bit lower than the knowledge because of also because of the effect size. But in general, the attitudes have improved. And you will all also notice that under the improved help-seeking help efficacy, we so far we have evaluated students' help-seeking efficacy in Ottawa region in our CT study. And the effect size is small to medium, but still very significant. And uh, this is the first step of our evaluation. And in the future study and the program evaluations, we're going to improve our uh, measures to focus on help seeking efficacy in the future. Great. Thanks, Yifan. So, then, 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 so that summarizes the, uh, the approach of the mental health literacy embedding and sustained way. And uh, what this demonstrates is if you look at the data, it doesn't matter what province or what school the intervention was provided. And remember, these interventions are not built on fidelity. They're just built on the teachers learning the information and then each teacher applying it in their own way, in their own classroom. We have similar results every single place. So this actually uh, shows us that the model is portable and it can be used anywhere without having to expect people to do fidelity of process. The second step on this horizontally integrated uh, approach to improving mental health care in the school setting brings together students, teachers, services providers, and community health and mental health care providers in the go-to educator training. And basically what this does is it in, it's a modified gatekeeper model and what it does in each school, it builds on the capacity already existing in every single school. And that is the capacity of the teachers, training the teachers who kids naturally go to for help. So this is the natural help seeker ecology of the school to be able to differentiate which kids actually may need mental health care or mental health services and to then work collaboratively with the student services providers in the school and with the local health care providers and mental health care providers to facilitate referral. So this is a complete identification, triage, support, and referral process, which because of the way the training is done, as Yifan will explain to you, brings together all the people that are necessary in this horizontal linked system so that facilitation of access to care improves dramatically because of this integration done in the training situation. Okay, I will just explain the go-to training um, in different provinces. We use the same approach as uh, how we uh, deliver the curriculum guide across Canada. And you will notice that schools will first identify the, the trainers, and the trainers is a multi a multidisciplinary team, including classroom teachers, health professionals in the school setting and local uh, mental health professionals. And also we deliver training in a way that for the first day we um, provide the foundation of the knowledge and uh, some introduction about a very <coughs> significant and important clinical tools for health providers and how to and also introduce the triage and referral system um, within each local health, pro uh, local health authority. So this is a very customized program from different provinces. And uh, then the trainers will deliver uh, the, um, the go-to training in their school settings. They will select go-to uh, go educators by themselves. And we have done some program evaluation as well in different provinces. And we have two measures at this stage, knowledge and attitudes. And you will notice that knowledge has improved significantly, and effect sizes are all above one, which is very, very strong uh, indicator of strong e effect sizes of this training. And also, 
uh, with attitude. But because of the ceiling effect, <coughs> because all these go-to educators, trainers of go-to educators are pre-selected, and they're more dedicated to improve mental, mental health of uh, um, children and youth. So they already have had very, very positive attitudes. Um, so there is there is a, a like stronger, like a bigger Im, uh, impact as knowledge. And also uh, in the future study, we're going to focus on help seeking efficacy. We're going to measure if trainers are more confident to help others uh, in the schools and also to help themselves. Thank you, Fed. So. The next part of this, uh, of this horizontal, the integrated piece, is how do you reach the parents? And uh, pretty well every school that we work with, the, this question comes up, how do we actually reach the parents? And one of the big challenges, of course, is that the parents that uh, need to be reached are often the parents that are the hardest to reach. So I don't have an answer. We don't have an answer to how to best do that. But I'll just share with you how we are trying to do that, because there are two ways that we're trying to do that that you may want to consider in your own setting is to see if they're effective. Because we focus this intervention at the junior high level, grade 9 or grade 10, um, we have created here in Halifax a community parent outreach program. We call them the junior high chats in which I and one of the teachers from the IWK uh, inpatient unit go to various high schools and we, edu we have these parent situations where parents come in, they can ask us any questions about their adolescent uh, and always it deals with mental health and it's a wonderful engaging model uh, that brings together the parents in each school community. The other thing that we try to do is we, in our school guide in the curriculum resource, so that it's part of the curriculum that the young people actually take in school, there is an actual compendium called How Do I Parent My Teen? And it's companion resource, How Do I Teen My Parent, uh, which the kids really like. And at this point in the curriculum, the young people are encouraged to bring this information back to their parents. And uh, so that this curriculum resource becomes a resource that is shared between parents and shared between the teen and themselves. I wish I had data to tell you how well this works. Unfortunately, we don't have that at this time, but we're working on it. The, the, the next thing that I want to discuss is this issue of community access points. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in standalone community access points, but I really want to argue very strongly that one of the most useful community access points for enhancing mental health care for young people are school-based health centers. And school-based health centers are not very common in Canada, and I think perhaps that they should be. Uh, they were initially developed to provide primary health care and hopefully prevent teen pregnancies in the United States. And the idea was that students could receive integrated health care, not just mental health, but physical and mental health care, in a setting which was familiar and non-stigmatizing, and it could integrate mental health promotion or health promotion with care, and all the different aspects could be, could be actually done at the same time. Some of the data that we have from the impact of school-based health centers is exceedingly positive. So, for example, Anglin studies show that teenagers were 10 times more uh, likely to access mental health care when they had a school-based uh, health center in the school. Um, when the school-based health centers were, were in the schools, young people actually went to them compared to usual primary care, had a very positive impact in traditionally underserviced populations, and they seemed to decrease the number of emergency room visits as well. In further studies, there were larger impacts that actual academic performance improved, fewer disciplinary problems, fewer school absences, and better school mental health care on site. Uh, and the authors have felt that these school-based health centers really contributed in a wide way to a whole air of variety of different components of youth health. And by the way, parents and students were very satisfied with the kind of care that they received. A very much more recent study, again showing exactly the same thing. It's the kids who are considering suicide, having trouble sleeping, sadness or depression, are using the school health centers and using them for mental health services. And then a final recent study 
uh, shows that uh, school health centers actually have an impact on health-related quality of life. All of these are very, very positive and very, very good components, and really the creation of a school health center, uh, one which not focuses only on health promotion, but a school health center in which physical health and mental health care are integrated together and the health providers are in the school health center there so a young person can access that care, uh, to me, makes just an awful lot of sense. And really, we should be looking at this, I would argue, uh, as a Canadian uh, a pri primary uh, focus. The last thing that we will discuss, and very, very briefly here, is the so what question, now that we've been able to enhance mental health literacy, we've been able to enhance identification and, and, and triage, what next? Well, it's fundamentally important that we enhance capacity in primary care. The Alma-Ata Declaration, the WHO in 1978, identified the primacy of primary health care as the focus for health care globally. And as you can see, uh, in the WHO's World Health Report followed all the way to the Mental Health Gap Intervention Guide, and in Canada, the family uh, patients, uh, family practice, patients, medical home model, all contribute to this really good way of enhancing uh, mental health care and primary health care. There are different ways to do it, and certainly collaborative care, as Nick Cates has demonstrated in, in, in the Hamilton model, is a really, really good way to do it. There are lots of good reasons for uh, enhancing capacity in mental health care and primary care because of time, I'm not going to go over them in any detail, but really one of the most key things here is we have to enhance the capacity and competency in primary health care. We need an appropriately trained primary health care workforce. And although this includes doctors, it is not just doctors. It is the provision of counselors, psychologists, therapists, nurses who are trained, primary health care nurses, uh, to provide this care uh, in, in the primary health care setting. Canadian data shows us that there is a tremendous need for this. Uh, primary care physicians know generally where to, where, to, where to refer young people, but they actually need the skill set. So this uh, amazing program that we've had the uh, privilege to be uh, part of, the PSD initiative, creating local uh, teams, and you can see that the local teams here bring together families, physicians, schools, specialist physicians, uh, and really create an integrated, wonderful community model to address uh, mental health care needs of young people. When we evaluate the capacity and competency of primary care physicians who have taken the training program, you see huge improvements in various aspects of their uh, competencies and, and confidence and actually a really wonderful improvement in their collaboration both within schools and within mental health. And this is so important because this horizontally integrated pathway to care uh, needs to include primary care as well. There's a very small and very interesting study actually looking at another part of this that was carried out in the Kingston area. And I just want to show you this uh, particular slide that when this training was done in the community and supported that what we had was care was provided to young people uh, with mood and anxiety disorders in the community. And what was being now referred to mental health specialty services were not the non-comorbid disorders, but the highly complex disorders as they probably should be. So my argument, again, coming back to the beginning of the presentation, was many of these ER visits for anxiety and depression may actually have been have been truncated had this capacity been available in the primary care setting at the time that the visits came. So here's the final question, question number three. Which of the following are evidence-based in-school interventions that may contribute to improved access to mental health care for young people? Uh, choose all that apply. Some of these I've talked about, some of them I haven't, and the ones that I haven't talked about, such as transitions and healthy minds, you may want to look up yourselves. Again, make your selections on the screen. And this, again, is a choose all that apply. So lots to choose from there and think about. So we'll give you uh, a few extra seconds to 
make your selections there. So which of these interventions might contribute to improved access to mental health care for young people in educational settings? It looks pretty even all the way down the list. It looks like uh, ranging from 78 to 91 percent, but uh, all pretty tight as far as considering all of these interventions might be contributing to improved mental health care for young people. Well, those are uh, interesting results. The, uh, the, the actual evidence-based interventions, as opposed to which interventions might be contributing, here are, for, that we talked about today, are items one and two. Um, and uh, there is another one, but that, that could be transitions or it could be healthy minds, and I uh, encourage people to look that up online themselves and to look for the evidence of the impact of those interventions as opposed to whether the interventions are actually available. So what I'd like to go to here now is the summary slide. So there are four key areas that we have tried to address. That we have only been able to touch on them uh, as schools role in the pathway to mental health care for young people. Uh, first of all, the schools have to be, they must be, uh, the site for enhancing mental health literacy for teachers and students alike. It really needs to be integrated in curriculum. It's been demonstrated to be in an effective way of improving knowledge, uh, decreasing stigma, and uh, enhancing help-seeking efficacy. And uh, really that is a step that has to be taken. It's uh, important that people not only be uh, able to talk about mental health, they have to be understand and they have to know what they're talking about and mental health literacy embedded in schools uh, has that potential. Uh, secondly, schools can be a site for identification, triage, referral and support of students who have a mental disorder and here the go-to gatekeeper model uh, is, a, is a model that, that, that works um, and uh, one that uh, could be considered the nice thing, I think, about this model is that it uses a training competency framework in which the training participants are the network. They are the referral network so that the people that participate are the people in the schools and the people in the community who are providing the services and they do it together and that, that, that changes the, the nature of referral pathways very, very, very nicely. Uh, the third thing is that the schools can be the site for the provision of mental health care. Uh, some uh, provinces have thought about and are putting in mental health clinicians. My personal opinion on that is that if there was a school-based health center where students could get all their uh, health care needs met, not just mental health, which might be stigmatizing if it's a mental health need met, I think that would be preferred. And finally, the schools can be the sites for engagement of the community. We've only given a couple of examples of community engagement through the schools. I'm sure that people can think of many other examples uh, of that as well. So those of you who are interested in doing some follow-up reading, here are a number of uh, papers uh, recently that address a number of the issues that we talked about today. And uh, they are certainly available on the uh, website uh, if you come to that uh, to download them and have a, uh, have a look at what uh, other people have said about the same topic. So thank you very, very much for your attention. And I realize we've gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that. And now I think that we have an opportunity to answer questions. That Yes, we do, and we're certainly not over time at all. We've got about uh, 30 minutes, uh, a little bit more, to take uh, care of any questions. So please do type your questions in if you do uh, have any. We, and we have quite a few uh, have come in already. Uh, the first question that did come in um, was from Victoria, and she was asking about uh, which provinces have and have not accessed the new curriculum. You, you showed us some data on the four provinces, but do you have any information about other provinces that have uh, accessed the curriculum? Yes, uh, and this is this has happened in a very uh, interesting way, Victoria. Uh, what, one of the fascinating things uh, from a knowledge translation perspective is that uh, some provinces have chosen to do this from a top-down approach, in which the actual provincial authorities responsible for curriculum in schools have said, "Yes, this is something that we would like to do." So Manitoba and Nova Scotia are examples of, of those kind of provinces, and, and, and they're now developing their processes for rolling that out in the different places. But in other provinces, uh, school boards, uh, individual schools, uh, have decided that they want to 
to utilize this curriculum resource. And it, it, there's a big difference between curriculum and curriculum resource. This is not curriculum. This is a curriculum resource. And one of the things is, is that we wouldn't be uh, you know, foolish enough to try to create curriculum for schools. That's not our, 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 our expertise. And it is the authority of the educational authorities in the provinces to create curriculum. We create resources that can be used in the curriculum. So that in, in, in many other provinces, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, um, uh, New Brunswick, uh, places in Newfoundland, there are many, many schools and school boards using this curriculum resource because it already meets the guidelines of the provincial curriculum. So that you don't have to change the provincial curriculum guidelines, you can actually take this resource and utilize it and it still meets the provincial curriculum guidelines. All right, and Victoria did have a sort of a follow-up question that I, you, you may answer. She, she was asking, have Ministry of Education taken on this curriculum as part of their overall curriculum? And you, you've clarified it's not a curriculum, it's a curriculum resource, and that it, it is being done differently in different provinces. But anything else from a, uh, the perspective of the Ministry of Education taking it on this resource and implementing it versus other bodies within governments or jurisdictions across the country? Well, uh, and I think that this is one of the, of the uh, strengths of this approach. The approach is not prescriptive, and it, it, the approach is permissive. So that if a ministry at the ministerial level wants to say this, every school must do this through the curriculum or whatever other route that they want to do it, they can do it should they choose to do it. But schools can also utilize the resource and they can utilize it within their own communities and still be within the jurisdictional framework of the ministry. So this kind of flexibility, being uh, permissive as a prescriptive, makes the application of this kind of approach even wider than an approach that is dependent upon a proscriptive and is, that, is this sort of along the lines of that fidelity of application not being as important for this type of program? That was a question that came up. We, we had to shorten that for the, the poll question to FOA. They were asking what FOA was, and that was fidelity of application. That's the kind of thing you were referring to. One of the, uh, the challenges here is that in lots of programs, when they are first designed and the results are, are, are looked at, it's the fidelity of the application program which often drives the comfort that one has in the results. So when you create a program and say it has to be put into this school and that school and that school and that school, there is a lot of attention paid to fidelity how the program is put into place in the process. Certainly what often happens with programs is that once the training gets beyond the first group of people, the capacity to ensure that fidelity is applied in order to get those results gets lost. So our approach is very different. Instead of demanding fidelity, we build on the existing social ecology and existing pedagogy of schools currently. So no two schools and no two teachers teach geography the same way. No two teachers teach mathematics the same way. What is important in the way that the teacher, the professional person who is doing the teaching, we, we rely on the professional competency of the teachers. What the professional person does is that they take their understanding of the subject matter and, uh, and help their students learn that subject matter in whatever way is pedagogically best suited for them and for their students. So we don't try to fit the student or the teacher into the box. We have the box that the teacher and student mold to their own use. And so we don't have to, to, to demonstrate fidelity of the, of the process. We just want to demonstrate fidelity of the content. So when the teachers learn how to use the resource and then they can apply it themselves in their own classroom settings, what we see is that the way the teachers have been doing this for decades and decades and decades works. So there's no difference between a teacher who is teaching mental health literacy in her or his classroom from a teacher who is teaching history or English literature or French or whatever in their classroom. And we get wonderful and very, very similar results everywhere that we do this. 
simply by using the capacity and the processes, the pedagogy, which already exists in schools. So this makes this model very able to be widely distributed because we don't have to teach people how to use a program and make sure that the people who are using the program are doing it the same way or else we can't guarantee the same results. We are saying every teacher has these professional competencies. What we are going to do is give the teacher the tools that they need to use their own professional competencies to embed that information to the students. And as you can see from the, the data, it works. Now, one thing that I can tell you, uh, we didn't show you this, we are now using this model in Malawi and Tanzania, and we're getting the same results in those schools uh, in Malawi and Tanzania that we're getting in the Canadian schools, which shows us that the model construct, which builds on the strengths, again, this is so different than other models, because it builds on the strength that already exists in the school to actually improve the mental health literacy for teachers and students. The other thing is when you do it that way, you, you are able to in, enhance the mental health literacy of both teachers and students at the same time. So you don't have to give a separate program for teachers. You don't have to take teachers and we're going to teach you about mental health today. No, we just take the teachers and have them learn how to use the resource and then their own mental health literacy improves dramatically. So it's a, it's a very different approach, much, much simple, simpler. It, it's actually uh, it's sort of embarrassing in its simplicity. Does any need to be embarrassed? <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, we did have a couple questions come in about the costs of the program. So uh, Kim uh, sent a question in on Twitter, and she was asking, she was saying she's interested in how the train the trainer is uh, funded in different provinces. And Lisa was also asking about what the cost of the training program is to the school districts. The 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 way that the the costing is done is on a cost recovery model. And the, it has been done differently in different provinces. In some provinces, uh, for example, Cynthia Weaver ran uh, is, and is, is running these training programs in Ontario out of Ontario Shores with a grant that the Ontario Shores organization received from a charitable foundation, which covers all the costs of the program. In other provinces, uh, different school boards have come together and uh, three or four school boards have come together, each chipped in a, a small amount of money and that easily, easily covers the cost of, of, of delivering the training programs. Once that initial training cost is, is, is done, uh, it's very, very simple because all the web-based materials are free. There is absolutely no charge to any of the web-based materials. That includes all the lesson plans, all the modules, all the resources, the animated videos, everything else that goes along with it and all the evaluations that teachers can then use as well. So, so all that is there. It's easily accessed on the website. And in fact, if, if teachers don't want to take the training session, they can still access all the resources for free. So, so the, the resources are free, not whatever the teachers want, want to do. The only data that we have says that if we train the teachers, we get those results. We don't know the data uh, for teachers who just go and use the material without the training. That I, I can't answer because we haven't done that, that study yet. Um, once the once the, the, um, the, 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 the program is available in the school setting, the school boards train their trainers, and then this, that just gets sustained over time. They can just rotate the trainers, and more people can become trainers over time. And because when the actual training happens for, for, for teachers, uh, it's done during professional development days. So there is no out-of-classroom time. It's already existing professional development, so the teachers uh, take that during their existing professional development days, and we get those uh, great results on a one-day training program, which can be done on a professional development day. Now, we have just updated all the materials. Uh, so all the materials now that are on the website actually have been improved and updated because as part of this training program that we've done, we've done a quality assurance process where we have received information from teachers who now have been using the material for a year or, or longer uh, on ways that the material could be improved. And so we have listened to what the teachers have told us, improved their lesson plans, improved the modules, improved the resources, and again, all that is freely available on the website. It is teenmentalhealth.org, as we can see up on the screen here. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, and someone was specifically asking about the how do I parent my teen uh, resource. Is that also on the website? To yeah, if, there, if there's more information wanted, if people just uh, just uh, email us at info at teenmentalhealth.org, we can give them all that information. Yes, that resource is available freely under the resources section of teenmentalhealth.org. Uh, just go on and click on you can get a PDF that uh, you can download uh, and, and utilize. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Elaine is uh, asking, what role does psychiatry play in this uh, in this model? The, the role of psychiatry depends on the setting in which the model is applied. Again, this is not a prescriptive model, it's a, it's, it's a permissive model. So uh, uh, if there are psychiatrists in the setting where the model is applied, they, they can certainly work as consultants and supporters for primary health care providers. They can participate in, 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 in actual doing the training for primary health care providers. So for example, the group at Queens, Nazreen Roberts, uh, who um, was the head of child uh, psychiatry division at Queens at the Hotel Dio Hospital there, they took that program and they embedded it into what work they do with their primary health care providers and the psychiatrists did the training with the primary health care providers. So it, 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 it isn't, there is no prescription, it is what works in the setting uh, what uh, works uh, to help uh, help kids improve their access to mental health care. Uh, this again is a feature of all the programs that we try to create. Uh, we don't try to create a program that says you've got to do it exactly this way. We say here's all the stuff, uh, take it, work with it, use it, make it work for you, and if you can improve it, wonderful, go ahead and improve it. Okay. Um, uh, Sherry is, uh, has noticed that the Train the Trainer program has been implemented in BC and she was wondering if this program has specifically come to Prince George yet, uh, if you, if you, I'm not sure if you know specifically if it's come there yet, but, uh. I, I don't know if the program is or is not in BC. We have just started in BC, uh, so I would doubt that it's come to, to Prince George yet. The, the person in BC who has been uh, leading the sort of initial development of this program uh, is uh, Do Dr. Wendy Carr, uh, who is uh, at, in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia. And interestingly enough there, uh, Wendy also is leading uh, a, a, an offshoot of this program, which is enhancing the mental health literacy for pre-service teachers. And uh, we've just now actually been working with her on um, the, the first study actually done, and I'll tell you that the results are gobsmackingly positive, which is which is great. The idea being that if we can enhance the mental health literacy for before they go into the classroom, that might be a useful thing. Uh, this next uh, comment, and more of a comment than a question, I think, uh, comes from one of our American colleagues in Maryland. Uh, Kathleen is saying that in Anne Arundel County in Maryland, in, in the U.S., uh, I think uh, a similar model has been adopted in the middle schools. They assign a school psychologist for each grade. That same psychologist follows the grade from grade 6 to 7 to 8. Uh, she believes that it was very important to her child during this period of her life and it seems they also engage teachers in an understanding of youth mental health. That's, that, that's, that's a wonderful idea, um, and that uh, any, any school setting that uh, I would applaud if they're able to put these kind of resources into classrooms, I, I think that this would be fantastic. If, if, if Canadian classrooms had a counselor or a psychologist that was assigned to a classroom or a group of classrooms on an ongoing basis and follow those kids over the course of their school trajectory, I think that would be just fantastic. Uh, I don't know of any such uh, approaches that are being done in Canada, uh, but uh, I think that, uh, that, that's, uh, that that's a really, really wonderful uh, idea if you actually have the resources uh, to actually do that. In Canadian schools, mostly that there are if, if a school is lucky enough to have a psychologist or a counselor in the school, that, that, that person uh, does an all-comers uh, kind of approach. All right. Um, Jasmine is asking uh, if there's a role for students in promoting overall mental health to their peers sort of as part of this, these, these types of programs. 
That's a so, really great, great, great question, Jasmine. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, uh, I was made aware of a very, very interesting initiative done in the Hamilton uh, Separate School Board in which teachers uh, worked with senior grade students using the, uh, the resources in this, uh, the guide, using information in the guide to create a program in which then senior students uh, provided to, to entry students into the uh, first year, uh, I think there were grade 9 or grade 10 students in the, in the secondary schools. And it, the, I thought this was just a wonderful use of the resource in a very innovative and thoughtful way and really highly engaging for students so that the students learned the resource, created materials based on it, and then provided that information and support and, and, and intervention to younger students in the same school. I think that that's fantastic. All right. Uh, Dave would like to talk in greater, deal, in greater detail about the Alberta Go to Educator outcomes. Uh, who could he contact in Alberta to have this conversation? The, the best person there would be Andrew Baxter. Uh, Andrew has been uh, has been doing just outstanding uh, work in, in, in Alberta, um, and um, I think he's at Alberta Health Services is probably the best way to get him, uh, or Laurie Watson Rowe, who is also with the Alberta Health Services, um, and so uh, I would ha strongly recommend contra contacting Andrew or, or Laurie. All right. Uh, Roberta's asking, uh, how beneficial are mindfulness strategies for children in kindergarten to grade five for health promotion and building skills for middle and secondary school years? And that, I, that is not a question that I know the answer to. I know that mindfulness is, is very popular. Uh, we actually have just been asked by our Ministry of Education, which in Nova Scotia is called the Department of Education, the same type of thing, uh, to do a systematic uh, review and a critical uh, Cochrane level analysis, uh, applying Oxford criteria and OJP uh, evaluation criteria, which are independent of, of reviewers, to uh, some mindfulness programs uh, in order to, uh, to provide uh, an independent uh, critical evaluation of the impact of these programs. So we are right now in the process of, uh, of doing that. We've just uh, completed the, uh, the survey analysis, um, and Yifen is actually leading that project. Uh, so um, I wish I had the answer for you right now, but I don't, I don't have the answer for you at this point in time, but hopefully in about four or five months, uh, we will actually have the answer to that question. It's a, it is a very... Uh, um, general question to ask because there are probably hundreds types of mindfulness programs out there for different age groups <coughs> in different settings and there are probably more than 30 or over 40 outcomes all these mindfulness me uh, measures have been created to measure the effectiveness. So far we have not concluded which program is the most effective because this is a very complicated question to answer because of the diversity of the program types and the different measures and the different study types but uh, we're trying to get a sense of how individual mindfulness programs work and if each school board or if school boards or in Department of Education or Faculty of Education wants to measure a particular program, we would seek evidence of effectiveness of those particular programs in the literature, and we're going to come up with a report uh, about the evidence of effectiveness of those programs using a very robust and validated um, framework and criteria in a systematic review approach. Yeah, so, so if people are interested in the approach that we use for this, they can go to our website and, and look up critical... What it called? Um, we, have, um, pro we have a project going on, and uh, also we call it a service we offered to school boards or different um, government agencies called SESM, Critically Evaluating School Mental Health. So under this approach, we're going to use a systematic review methodology to evaluate or to collect evidence of effectiveness of programs 
schools or government agencies request us to evaluate. Uh, the next comment has come in from Dave. Uh, he's saying, as a nine-year school board trustee and former board chair, he's curious about uh, when you referenced uh, the engaging school boards. He doesn't recall anything about this coming to the attention of their school board. Uh, he was there from 2004 to 2013. Uh, he, was, he's, he goes on to ask, were you engaging school boards or school board administrators? Uh, I don't know what school board Dave was at, but we uh, we have tried to, given the information that we can find, uh, engage uh, school boards throughout the entire country. And uh, some of the engagement has been direct. We've been able to identify directly people uh, in different school boards. They could have been board chairs. They could have been uh, uh, administrators, they would not have been individual trustees for sure because we wouldn't have that, that information easily available. Uh, in other places, different school boards, uh, the board chairs or trustees talked to each other and said, listen, this is something that we're doing, would you like to do it? Or adm senior administrative staff in the school boards would have talked to each other to do that. So uh, Dave, I don't know where you are, but uh, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, we could certainly have a further discussion. I think he was from Alberta, but I uh, I don't see him on the. I think he had to leave uh, right around 12, unfortunately. So perhaps he's coming back to the recording to hear your your response, and hopefully he'll be in touch. Uh, Rihanna is uh, uh, asking in Ontario: Is the program that is associated with the CCACs putting a mental health nurse slash case manager into schools is that in any way tied to this training program? No, it's not. Uh, Ontario and, and, and many other provinces are doing lots of different things. Some provinces doing more, some doing less. Um, that being said, many of these schools, uh, boards in Ontario that have used these programs, the uh, mental health clinicians that are in those boards have taken part in the programs. Uh, and uh, the response that we've had from the mental health clinicians has been uh, very, very positive. In fact, that that's what we would actually encourage, so that uh, the mental health clinicians and the Ontario boards for schools that are doing this program would be included as part of the team that then becomes the sustainable team, both for the guide resource and for the go-to resource. And it, 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 it just makes total sense because what it actually does is it enhances the integration within the school setting. And the beauty of the mental health clinicians is that, that many of the mental health clinicians are, are, are excellent uh, at what they do and they have very good contacts within the healthcare system, uh, often within specialty mental health uh, services. And so that again enhances the, uh, the, the continuity and the horizontal integration between the school and the, uh, the, the, the healthcare system using the mental health clinician as part of that, uh, that link. So uh, in fact, Ontario, I think, is very well placed uh, to be able to utilize this work in, 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 a, in an even more comprehensive way because uh, of the fact that there are uh, many school boards now do have these mental health clinicians which can, can provide support to the school, to the teacher, to the young person, and also enhance that horizontal integration uh, across the system. All right, Victoria, who I asked a question earlier, put in a comment. She's saying, thank you so much for making so much available to schools for free, uh, taking away one more barrier to enhancing our youth mental health literacy. She says, you, are, you guys are so appreciated. So I'm sure well, thank you for your comments. Yeah. Um, Elise is asking, what about youth with addictions? Can the same model be applied, especially with the knowledge of current concurrent disorders? That's a that's an absolutely fantastic question. <coughs> we do touch on addictions in the curriculum. It's certainly in module three is a big is a part of the curriculum as because that's the module that addresses mental disorders and substance use disorders are addressed in that part of the module. The, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, now I'm blind, Coalition on Substance Abuse has outstanding educational materials. So uh, as, a, um, as a rule of thumb, as an actually a guiding principle for us, is we don't try to duplicate other people's materials. Uh, Canada is a small nation, 
uh, we have gone to tremendous lengths to, to, to determine whether we have good evidence of effectiveness of our materials, and we do. And we, uh, we've also looked at, at materials other people and other organizations have created, and we don't try to duplicate something someone else did, so we really refer schools to that use of the educational materials of the Canadian Center of Substance Abuse, which are absolutely excellent. Follow-up question from Elaine. Uh, it was related to the question earlier asking about the role of psychiatry. She was specifically wanting to hear about what role, and she's using some abbreviations here. I'm not sure if I'm going to know what they are. CYMH and MCFD uh, play in the program. She's in BC. That might be Ministry of Child and Family something, something. I'm not sure what CYMH is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, Elaine, a couple of things. One is that in the PSP program, the primary care program, and these representatives from those uh, ministries were uh, on the group that, that worked to create that program. And uh, in, the, in the BC uh, primary care collaboratives, uh, my understanding is that in the development of these primary care collaboratives, there are representatives from those, those ministries on each of the collaboratives that has been developed in BC. So uh, uh, hopefully that, that, that answers your question. If, if, if that hasn't answered your question, um, I would strongly suggest that you, you contact the Physician Support Program uh, of the BCMA and, and, and ask that question. Or alternatively, you could contact Jana Davidson, uh, who is the uh, Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at UBC, and she's at the BC Children's Hospital. and uh, uh, either the people at the PSD or Janet Davidson would be able to give you much more specific information than I can give you. Thank you to all the people who put into the question box what uh, that it was Ministry of Child and Family Development. So <laughs> thank you to everyone who did that. Um, Nancy's asking, you know, again, people very interested in this program, wondering if it's in their area. Nancy's asking if the program has started in any of the Toronto school boards. Well, uh, Nancy, that's a fascinating question. Um, we did a, a, some early pilot work with the Toronto School Boards, and there actually will be a publication coming out in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry this year uh, of these, the research showing this huge positive impact in the Toronto District School Boards, the three schools that participated in the study. Uh, so uh, I don't know if the TDSB is, is now embedded the program into the TDSB or not, uh, but certainly they were a site for the uh, actual research on the program. Uh, you'd have to check with uh, your board and your board chair to answer that question, and if, if they're doing it, that's fantastic. If they're not doing it and want a refresher or want to, uh, to, to, to move that forward, the best person to contact is Cynthia Weaver. Uh, and you can contact her through now KINARC because I understand she's gone over to, to, to uh, have a, a major role at KINARC Youth Services, uh, or you can actually also probably still contact her through the Ontario Shores who would know how to get a hold of her. So that's Cynthia Weaver, either through KINARC or through Ontario Shores. But the TDSB data, which I wish I could tell you, your friend did show it to you, <laughs> is highly, highly positive. And the TDSB data we collectionally was uh, not a board-wide <coughs> pilot research, just a very small part. So we're not sure if the whole board has adopted program or not, and we are willing and happy to move ahead based on that. The next question is coming in from Julie, and she's asking if you can speak a bit more about the implementation of school-based health centers in Canada. Where have, they be, where have they been implemented, and with what sort of results? Given the difference between healthcare systems in Canada and the U.S., are there differences in outcomes between the two countries? Wow. <laughs> I wish I could answer that question. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you've put me on the spot here, Julie, and fair enough. Uh, to my understanding, the idea of a school-based health center is not a concept which is widely distributed across the country. And so I r raise this as an issue because I think it is a, a glaring omission uh, in schools. Uh, frankly, I think that uh, putting mental health clinicians into schools is, is, is useful, but I think that it's not optimal. 
In my opinion, we should have school health centers where mental health clinicians can work collaboratively and together with uh, other clinicians to provide a full spectrum of care for young people dealing with their physical and mental health at the same time. Now, in Nova Scotia, we have school-based health centers. They're called youth health centers, not in all the schools, uh, in some of them, in secondary schools. There have been two evaluations done of those uh, youth health centers, one by Darcy Santor uh, and by, by Magnus Moers. And uh, both those studies showed that the way that those health centers were functioning were not meeting the mental health care needs of young people. Now, when you drill down into that data, what you find is that there are some youth health centers which are set up to actually do that, but other youth health centers which are not set up to do that. So I, I really thank you for asking this question because a youth health center is not a panacea. A youth health center has to be set up the right way. So it has to be set up so that kids are welcome there. It has to be set up to do more than health promotion. It has to be actually set up with the experts and expertise in the health center so that young people can actually go to the, the school-based health center. They can, if they have a problem with their diabetes, they can get that dealt with. If they have a problem with a rash, they can get that dealt with. If they have a problem with a panic attack, they can get that dealt with. And they can get it all done effectively, confidentially, with easy access. Now, these youth health centers are also, I would argue, very, very important for youth who are either living in rural areas or youth who have trouble accessing primary health care in any, any other way. So if there are cultural barriers or socioeconomic barriers to youth accessing primary health care, because most of the youth are already in the school, they're able to access that care through the school. If they're living in a rural area, the young person can access that health care when they are in their school instead of having to go home, then drive often for a very, very long distance. And in the winter in Canada, that can be a huge problem, and then drive back home to access health care. So uh, I think that in Canadian settings, we really have to start looking pretty carefully at uh, this uh, wonderful uh, potentially very, very useful intervention called the school-based health center. Right. Um, Sherry is uh, curious. She says that she's wondering if there's any content within the curriculum on the social determinants of mental health. <laughs> the, the, the curriculum uh, is, is very clear on how it approaches the, uh, the aspects of development of mental health and the, and, and the in, uh, impacts of the, of the environment on the development of mental disorders. And it also has very important components in there for evidence-based pieces that can contribute to positive mental health and, and mental well-being of young people. So it, it does a, a number of different things. For example, there are resources in, in the curriculum which use evidence-based behavioral activation uh, uh, models which apply across uh, all different uh, components, very easy to do for young people that which we know can enhance their mental health but also help them if they have a mental disorder. And we teach kids the importance of the impact of environment on the development of mental disorders and the complex interplay between genetics and environment. So the, the, the curriculum approach is a wide-based approach it looks at the best evidence that we have on all these different components and addresses them as a holistic uh, piece, not as, uh, as one piece over here and one piece over here. Um, there is a module in the curriculum guide called um, The Importance of Positive Mental Health. We address a number of factors that would uh, play an important role in promoting students and youth mental health. For example, how physical health play a very important role in how it's related to mental health and how social relationships, how you build relationships with others, with families, with peers to enhance your mental health and how to address stress, how to manage stress and how to do other things that can help you to improve and maintain your good mental health.
We're just about out of time. We'll, we, we do have, we're not gonna, going to be able to get to everyone's question and comment, unfortunately, because we have about two minutes left. Uh, so we'll just take a couple more. Uh, Elaine is, is asking if the program has a, a process to determine or to identify who might determine whether the school is a sufficient setting versus when more intensive service is needed. Uh, excellent question. That's done on a case-by-case -case basis, and so part of the go-to training is, 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 is developing the triage capacity and the triage skill sets within the school setting. And this is why it's so important and why the training model has actually been set up to include, and I want to emphasize this, include local community health providers and mental health care providers. So that in that integration and that, and that discussion and that capacity building of the triage competency within the school, not only does that get built up, but the interprofessional linkages between individuals gets built up. And what we have found um, from information given to us now by schools that are using this model is that the person in the school, if they're not sure, simply picks up the phone and calls the person they were trained together with and says, here's this kid, what are your thoughts on it? So what it actually does, it increases the community of care around a particular child. And I think that's just to the benefit of the child. Okay. All right, so we'll take one last comment here. Um, uh, and David is saying, for the for the purposes of transparency, uh, he's wondering if there's been any criticisms that may have been levied toward the program. Has there been anyone who has, has that you've approached that has said no, that they're not interested in the program? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, we don't. I don't go around asking people if they want the program. We make the pe program available, and people avail themselves of it. I don't know of any uh, of any um, substantive criticism of the program or or, or or anything like that. Now. I've been around the world for a lot of long, long time, and I know that it doesn't matter what you do, there's always people who criticize what you do, and that's wonderful, and that's welcome. And in fact, we really welcome uh, thoughtful uh, criticism, and if we can improve the program in any way, we do that. In fact, we've, uh, we've embedded that in our program uh, evaluation processes. And uh, in fact, as Yifen was saying earlier, we have updated the curriculum just now, just uh, over, the, over the summer months, to, to uh, integrate the critical feedback that we have received on the program. And I think that as a result of that really good critical feedback that we have received from educators, the program actually has improved. Uh, we've had a lot of questions of people uh, wondering if it's implemented in their area, what have you, and a lot of questions on who they can talk to in their area. It, is that information easily easy to find on your website? So, on a pro, like on, in a particular province, where can they get trained, or who might the trainer be in that area, or which uh, school boards might be using this this material? Is there is there an I easy way to find that? The easiest way to do that, the, the easiest way to do that is to contact uh, us through info at teenmentalhealth.org. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can. And, uh, uh, I'll, I'll type an. E can I type uh, here, Doug, an email address? Uh, no, you can't. We've got it on our screen right now. Is uh, is your is the is the contact information on the website that we can just put up for people? Uh, it's That's info cool. at teenmentalhealth.org. Or if people we just want to contact Amy McKay in our office, uh, if you go, if you just come to our website, uh, you can get on info at teenmentalhealth.org or uh, Amy McKay, Amy dot McKay. That's M-A-C-K-A-Y at uh, I-W-K dot N-S-Health dot C-A. Maybe, uh, uh, Doug, I can give you that email address. Sure, yeah. If you, if, you, uh, if you give me that contact information, we'll put it up on the page on the Knowledge Exchange Network that people will be directed to uh, following this webinar. And we'll just say for more information and we'll, we'll put that... Uh, that up there, like tell in, in indicating people to go to the website, and if they want specific information, that's that we'll put that contact information. Great. All right. Well, I think uh, that we will wrap it up here. We're going to hand it over to you uh, 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 for for any final closing comments that you'd like to uh, end this with. I'd just like to say that Nancy has said she's going to be sharing this information with 55 public health nurses. Uh, 
Tanya is going to be has purchased the manual and will be presenting to their school knowledge coordinator and the teachers in their community. So people are really uh, jumping on this uh, this this program and are and are interested in sharing it throughout their network. So this is really great. So so we'll hand it over to you to you guys for one any any closing comments before we wrap this up. Okay, uh, Tanya, that was a mistake. We're putting the new new syllabus on, on <laughs> online in about a week. <laughs> I just have it sitting here right on the desk. So anyhow, if you if you if you uh, send me a note, we'll send you a copy of the new syllabus. <laughs> so you'll have the new one. People don't purchase stuff. Wait, wait, wait. Please don't purchase stuff. Um, just go on and look at the modules. They're all for free. Uh, listen. Uh, we are all in this together. One of the things that we have learned here is that it is essential, absolutely essential, because schools are where kids are. You know, uh, in our society, we have created two institutions that help parents raise their children. One institution is called the school, and the other institution is called the jail. And we really want to focus on keeping kids out of jail. We want to focus also on helping kids become the best that they can. And really, really specifically, we want to try to ensure that every single kid in this country of ours who really needs mental health care gets it. The onset of these disorders is, is, is in the early years. The ability for schools to be part of the process in the horizontally integrated approach to mental health care is huge. The capacity to build that competency in primary care is huge. This is an issue of not do we know what to do. This is an issue of we do know what to do. We now have some tools to help us do it. And now we just got to get on doing it. All right. Well, thank you very much. I guess we'll wrap it up here. Fantastic presentation. As you can tell, we, we couldn't even get through all of the questions and comments, and the, the, the question box is filling up with all sorts of thank yous and people saying that they will hold off and they'll be purchasing the new one when it's available. So really fantastic. So thank you very much to, for, for bringing this great content to our audience. And thanks to Capsi again for, for hosting us. All thank right. you, everyone. Yeah, and thanks to uh, thanks to our audience for joining us today. We do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it's always great when you can watch live as those questions and comments really make for the discussion, as you can see today. But if you can't watch live, we do always record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. But we've got some great uh, webinars coming up in the calendar. Next week, we are uh, once again excited to partner with the Public Health Agency of Canada on a, on some of their FASD, Field Alcohol Spectrum Disorder work, and uh, next week is also uh, September 9th is the International FASD Day. So we're going to be having a webinar presentation titled Caregiving, FASD and Alcohol, Caring About FASD Prevention. We'll be hearing from award-winning journalist and author Ann Dowsett Johnston as we talk about stigma and addressing a culture that blames and shames children and families with FASD. And then we'll hear from Dorothy Badry and Deb Goodman, who work with the Public Health Agency and the Toronto Children's Aid Society to develop a very practical resource called the Caregivers Curriculum on FASD, uh, which is a resource to help support those that are caring for children with FASD. So we're sort of on a roll with curriculums uh, here with considering today's presentation and what we have coming up next week. And then following that on September 16th, we will once again hear from our colleagues from our Interfacility Critical Care Transport Group uh, as we hear about an innovative approach to using technology to manage patients in remote communities as an alternative to transporting infants who may be better served by remaining in their communities. We'll hear from Dr. Tanya Holt at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon and one of their partners, Rachel Johnston, who's a, a, nurse, a, a nurse practitioner in Pelican Narrows as they share their experiences using robots, yes, you heard me correctly, robots, uh, to uh, engage uh, with remote communities to provide uh, specialized care that's usually just available at our academic center. So a great presentation on September 16th for anyone who works with communities uh, in remote areas and need to provide specialized uh, pediatric health services. So lots of great inf uh, information in the calendar about future webinars. So always go and check at CAFC.org, the CAFC Presents section, if you uh, uh, need more information. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you at some of our upcoming webinars. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you back here next week, hopefully. Bye, everyone.